Good morning, Lompoc. Good morning, Lompoc. It is so good to see you guys. We hardly see you, but thanks for being here. <laughs> it is Earth Day. It is Earth Day. The Happy 50th Earth Day. anniversary of Earth Day, which sta started in Santa Barbara. Yep, in 1970. Cool. Well, the it started partly because of Santa Barbara, what yes. happened in Santa Barbara in 1969. Yeah. And the following year, um, they, they created a national holiday. So it's Earth Day, 50 years. I know, celebrated today. Yeah. So congratulations to anyone who's uh, been a part of that down in Santa Barbara over the years. Yep. And uh, congratulations to the world for paying attention to yep. Mother for Earth waking today. Waking up a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so that first intro there, that was Refugio Beach. That was yeah. in 2018. So um, three years after the oil spill on Refugio Beach, that was in May of 2015. Yeah. So that... Um, that spilled, if you remember, about 3,400 barrels of oil um, on the beach. The oil it was a mess. Yeah. It was a mess. And I remember seeing it. You remember seeing the, um, the, the cleanup crew out there and the oil spill in Santa Barbara that kind of kicked off Earth Day in 1969. Um, in January of 1969 was about 77,000 barrels of oil wow. just for comparison what a mess. um and still not even close to being one of the biggest right? so yeah it's kind of crazy um so as we were doing our testing here earlier we were having some sound issues with some of the slides so we're hoping that it uh hope it works it, if our sound, sound if our sound drops off and we're talking and you can't hear us don't turn it off just hang tight yeah we'll Plug it in and figure it out. So we're still yeah. uh, still working this out. We might off, have to go live again or shut it down because we're seeming to have some just program hang issues. So we'll please let out. us know if anything pops up. Um, but first, we had um, you had some fun local news to share before we get into yeah, the well, Earth Day stuff. See. So uh, this is kind of fun. Make sure this works. Let's make sure our sound works here. Yep. Okay. Like so far, so good. Ah. So this is Belia Delgado. Yeah, she turned 97 years old. And as you know, uh, when you're when you're in a senior center, uh, convalescent care type center, uh, there's no going inside to see your family. So unfortunately, they weren't able to meet in person. But through the window, this family got together and um, did something really thoughtful for Billy. Yeah, so they did a little drive by. Yeah. And everybody said, happy birthday. Look at that whole caravan. Hopefully, Belia felt super special. Yes. And happy ninety seventh birthday. Happy ninety seventh birthday, Belia. That That's was just pretty amazing. Really, really cool. Okay, so, our sound thoughtful. works through that. I know we're getting a little bit nervous. That, that every time we clicked a slide earlier, oh. uh, the sound would just shut off. It was so. like a minute, <laughs> minute and ten seconds left, and the yes. sound went. Yes. Oh, we're always we're always um, pushing to the last minute. So, and we'll then we found some um, fun videos yeah. too. These are sort of random, but you know, uh, it's important to laugh and uh, stay a little bit uh, funny yeah. these days. So I found a, some random things this that made is, me this laugh. This is just a father daughter working out at home. Anyone can do this, probably not. Maybe don't try this without a little bit of practice. Oh my God, really? <laughs> All right. So, oh my God. So you and I are going to practice this uh, inside Jeez. later. Uh, Probably their first try at this. Uh, yeah. Oh my God. Oh, I man. still every time. Oh, I, come on. Hang in there, me. folks. <laughs> she survives. Oh my God. She looks like a doll child, doesn't she? She's like a little doll. That's just crazy. Liberty. That's, that's a trust factor right oh, there. Oh my what? God. So I spotted this on Virgin Radio Lebanon. So just so they get credit. I just thought that I was incredible. Kind of out there. <laughs> a little bit crazy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and don't you, don't try that at home unless you're qualified, um, certified maybe. Now, if you are stuck at home, but maybe you don't have those types of skills, but you want to get out of the house a bit. Um, this, I know some folks in Lompoc that can pull this one off really well. This guy had another idea. Wife thinks he's working. Oh, God. So creative. But there could be some serious accidents with this, so don't try this. <laughs> oh man i think that's pretty fun oh man that was good that was good um, all right what else so we now have? we're getting into a little bit more sciencey stuff okay. trying to make a little bit of a segue but yeah. um you found, you found this quadruple rainbow yeah so this isn't photoshop this is actually real and i kind of looked into it i was like wow that's cool how does that even happen so i read into it and it says um there's a meteorologist that says this rarely happens but it can happen when there's a body of a, a body of water behind the photographer 
and that body of water is super still, then the reflection off of that into the clouds or into the mist or whatever can create that illusion for rainbows. It's actually maybe two double rainbows. Um, but anyway, I thought that was kind of cool. So if you ever see that, please snap a photo and send it to us. And, and then you found a jellyfish too. So we were in Venice, Italy uh, last year and all the boats going all crazy and we didn't see any fish in the water. But since no one's doing anything, the water is cleared up a little bit. And this was spotted in uh, Venice, Italy, just a jellyfish cruising through the canal. Yeah. I don't know why cool. that makes me hungry. I mean, oh, my. <laughs> what? okay, that's so bad. That's improper. Uh, clearly I'm not a vegetarian. Um, <laughs> calamari. You're like, food. <laughs> oh, food. I, no, stop. Okay. okay. Let's keep moving. Um, so Kristen Labonte, she's a research librarian at UCSB. She's going to tell us more about the history of the oil spill in yes. Santa Barbara. What were you about I was to just going to say, um, I met, and if uh, Wes or Chandra, any of those, uh, I personally met uh, Kristen Labonte working at Clopepe Vineyards picking grapes, I think in 2004. So I was 16 years ago. And uh, she's I just. I thought you were going to say you're 16. I'm like, no. No, she, but she's, a, <laughs> she's an amazing person, has uh, worked her way up at UCSB, and it's just full of facts and uh, fun tidbits. So I'm yeah. glad you got a chance to talk to her about Earth Day. Yeah. yeah. And her husband works here in Lompoc too. So still Lompoc connection. But um, before we get to that, so just a quick slide. This was the, the extent of the spill. Um, it went on for months and months. It went on until December. So January 28th till December. And um, just in one day, it covered 75 square miles and it eventually covered um, 600, about 660 my square miles of the coast that's, that's crazy how, that was the extent of that spill um wow. but let's let's go to Kristen. she's going to tell us a little bit All more right. about thank it, you so. Kristen. so january 28th 1969 there was a very large oil blowout that happened in the santa barbara channel um it's been referred to as an oil spill but it was actually a blowout that was caused as workers were pulling a pipe up that they were uh, drilling a well for off of Platform A, just off the coast of Santa Barbara. And within 100 days, 77,000 barrels of oil were released into the ocean. And at the maximum of this catastrophe, there were 660 square miles of coast that were coated with oil. So it was a huge environmental catastrophe. And ultimately, they cleaned the beaches of Santa Barbara by putting hay down and scraping up the oil. And in certain areas where the oil collected, like the Santa Barbara Harbor, they were able to pump the oil from the surface of the water using trucks. And the community rallied as a result, um, both locally and nationally and internationally. And locally, we had um, a group called Goo, Get Oil Out, that was formed immediately following the spill. And they did a lot of grassroots work to try to persuade legislators to do more to help the environment because there were not many environmental regulations at that time. Shortly thereafter, um, the Community Environmental Council was formed in Santa Barbara as well as the Environmental Defense Center. Earth Day itself was, um, was an idea that Wisconsin Senator Gaylord Nelson came up with um, in 1969, he had actually been on a flight from San Diego to Seattle and observed the Santa Barbara oil spill from up above. And also in 1969, the Cuyahoga River in uh, Ohio caught fire because it was so polluted. So there were a number of things that were leading up to the citizens of America getting really upset about not having enough um, environmental legislature to help protect our environment and our people. The idea that Gaylord came up with was a, a national day for the environment where people acted locally in political action. And leading up to it, uh, he encouraged citizens to investigate environmental problems in their own communities and develop their own responses. And so while he didn't spearhead the actual day, he kind of got the ball rolling. and. Um, when it came to the actual Earth Day event on April 22nd, they estimated 20 million Americans participated, which is one in 10 Americans. So it was quite significant. The Community Environmental Council is hosting the 50th 
anniversary Earth Day, and it's going to be a virtual event today. And it's going to go from 12 to 5 with all kinds of performers and speakers. And there's also going to be some kind of virtual beer garden from 5 to 7. And then there's going to be a replay from 7 to 11. The last hour of their events um, from 4 to 5 and from 10 to 11, there's going to be an author talk. Um, Elizabeth Rush wrote this book, Rising, uh, Dispatches from the New American Shore, and it's about sea level rise in America. It's a wonderful book. I anticipate her talk will be very interesting to see, and um, it's really nice that it's going to be part of this programming. So I think that um, as we are sheltering at home during the pandemic, we can consider how we might keep reducing our impact as we start to move forward with this, as we return to work, how can we keep the cleaner air that we've been kind of uh, lucky to have as a side effect of this? Is it a silver lining? Maybe we'll call it a silver lining um, that um, air pollution across the globe has gone down dramatically. Demand for fossil fuels has gone down dramatically. I think being able to enjoy as much of nature as you can is a really special thing. And, you know, right now we have um, beaches open. We can be distanced from others and, you know, really enjoy the fresh air that we get that comes off of the Pacific Ocean. We're really lucky to live on the central coast and to have the kind of climate where we can enjoy ourselves this time of year. And if you have the space to grow food, it's a nice time to get back to that. Thank you, Krista. Yeah, thank you so much, Krista. That's really awesome. Yeah. Um, I learned a lot from, <laughs> from that. I, I mean, I knew San, uh, Santa Barbara was the birthplace of Earth Day. Uh, but I didn't know the severity of some of the, the yeah. issues that um, kind of made that all happen. Yeah. Still fascinating to me that Nixon was the guy who started the EPA a few yeah. years later. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, it's so many, so much less, blah, 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 so much, so many laws and legislation came out of that. Um, and the EPA was formed shortly thereafter, along with the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act. There was very few restrictions. Um, like she said, the uh, I cannot ever pronounce it, the Cuyahoga river caught yeah, fire crazy um right? so because it was so polluted so mm -hmm. it was a it was a big deal um and all those photos on there i pulled well i want to say 95 percent of those photos yeah. i pulled from the ucsb um library website she put together this amazing gallery um that just showed here we go um so this is all on the ucsb website if you wanted to dig deeper and there's tons of quotes in wow. here um and she kind of goes through the list of what happened um, and the anatomy of the blowout. Um, there's images from wildlife, um, birds, um, quotes of people that witnessed it. So that was pretty, yeah. pretty impressive little gallery. I think we, uh, you know, it would have been a little bit out of sight, out of mind, except like we mentioned in 2015, there was another you know, slightly smaller spill, but that affected our ability to go to, you know, 20 minutes down the road to yeah. Refugio Beach, which is beautiful. Um, so yeah, it's, I wouldn't say how to say I mean, we've had a lot of oil spills yeah, in the last, you know I mean, yeah. I wasn't going to get to this. Well, let me just show you. So this was the size of the slick here. Um, that's from one of the, an old paper from 1969. So this was wow. February. So it continued to expand way past this. Hmm. But then I found this comparison chart, um, that showed different sized oil spills. Wow. Um, and so those dots are sizes of the spill. So oh. that I circled Santa Barbara there. And then you look at deep water, water horizon and what happened there. Oh um, and they just keep, I mean, it, it's kind of mind boggling. And to know what an impact this had on locals here in Santa Barbara and how big and overwhelming sure. that seems yep. um, that was. Yep. And then to look at how many times it's happened and these communities have to deal with it. I think it's a, it's a really big deal. Um, but it was a result of a lot of people. Um, this was a, uh, the get oil out yeah. um grassroots group um bud Bo bottoms was the founder of it huh. um they put a lot of political pressure on people they had petitions um they sent vials of oil to politicians Can you imagine from the beach getting your um, box as a senator there was so much political pressure um 
in the news. And as a result, um, they declared the first Earth Day the following year. And huh. there's uh, Nixon and the First Lady planting a tree. Um, they also put together an environmental um, declaration of rights. Huh. Um, and I just love this one quote from here. We must find the courage to take upon ourselves as individuals responsibility for the welfare of the whole environment, treating our own backyards as if they were the world and the world as if it were our backyard. So I just found that to be pretty impressive. So um, how can you celebrate Earth Day today? Um, There's as as Kristen mentioned, there's going to be a virtual event. They usually do a festival every year, but I guess in this way it uses less resources anyway. So maybe it's fitting for the 50th anniversary. Um, Earth is happy. Yeah. So if you go to SB, um, SB Earth Day, Dot org, org. Yeah. yeah. Um, you saw it on there. Anyways, um, they're going to be doing a virtual event beginning at noon today. Yes. And there's going to be a lot of musicians and speakers, yeah. and it should be a lot of fun. Um, there's also, you know, different activities. This is um, Stephanie Green. Hey, Stephanie. Thank you. Her and her kids um, did these rocks where they heated up these rocks in the oven, Ooh. and then they used old crayons to decorate these rocks. So That's they cool. took the crayons, and when the rocks were hot, obviously the kids didn't touch them, and they melted the um, wow. crayon on there. That's really cool. I didn't even know you could do that. Because they're just so hot, they just melt immediately. And it almost has like a glossy sort of um, look to it. So I thought that was pretty cool. It is really cool. I'm going to go cook some rocks. Yeah. (laughs) See, look how that bleeds into there. That's That's kind of the final result. A little bit more of a marbled sort of effect to it. So... Parents, are you doing doing some cool things with your kids? Send it to us. We yeah. want to show other people what they could be doing for fun. And obviously, it's a great creative. time to start planting your garden. Yes. Um, it's got obviously very warm this week with kind of no end in sight, which is yes. good, nice so far. In the mid 70s, maybe a little higher for yeah. the next foreseeable seven, eight days. And Jeremy Rath is going to give us some tips on um, starting your garden. But I did find the, a couple clips that I found were kind of cool. This um, lady, Amy, in uh, Nova Scotia, she, um, wow, she took food scraps. And then um, put them in water, and that's how they sprouted. So her website um, shows a lot of really, she has a lot of good tips. She tells you kind of what would work in this fashion. But um, look how many things she got going there. I thought that was pretty impressive. That is cool. Um, So a couple different things you could do. Yeah. Um, So, yeah. Jeremy Raff. Yes, Jeremy Raff. Jeremy Raff. uh, one half of the RAF duo. Yeah, uh, RAF Dream Team. Yes, out at Dare to Dream Farms. Really good friends. That's where we get our produce from. Yeah. We get most of our eggs we from. We first met them when we got backyard chickens back in 2013. Yes. Which we don't have anymore, no. but... Um, but they're awesome people. They um, are. Um, Jeremy, uh, their farm has been exponentially uh, busier over the last few weeks because of the demand for backyard chickens and eggs and yep. people need food. Uh, so for him so to take some from driving like three, four hours yeah, away to crazy. come and get chickens from them. So so for Jeremy to take a few minutes of his time um, to spend with us so we could ask him some of our questions. Yes. That's awesome. So thank you so much, Jeremy. Yes. Best name ever for doing that. That's yeah. Awesome. yeah. And um, all his tips. It's interesting because I, I felt like I really needed this. So these were important for me. So I asked questions that um, I, the only thing I've ever grown successfully is Swiss chard. And I've also seen that growing on the freeway. So I think that's not anything to brag about. So this was helpful for me and hopefully it will be helpful for you. Thank, so you, thank Jeremy. you, Jeremy. What would be like the number one most important tip to when you, when you start your garden? Know that you're going to fail a couple of times. <laughs> uh, it's warfare in the garden. You constantly have bugs, um, birds, um, critters like gophers, rabbits, diseases that can affect the plants. Um, so knowing, um, knowing that you're going to fail is probably the number one thing you have to keep in mind because if you go into it with super high expectations that everything that you're going to plant is going to make it mm-hmm. and half of it doesn't, then it can be incredibly discouraging and people don't want to try again. So mm-hmm. go into the mindset that um, you can do better next time and it's okay. It's okay to fail. <laughs> so I'm a just sort of gardening random question. I think um, for a lot of us who don't have necessarily green thumbs, we kind of default back to probably overwatering because we always assume we forgot. Is yeah. how, how does a farmer look at at his field or his crops and think about watering or one we we know like when a plant is small and its roots are shallow, 
you need to water more often. Mm -hmm. But as the plant grows, um, then you need to water less because the roots go deeper and the moisture is held deeper into the soil. Mm. It's also good to start spacing it out more because if you continually to water shallow, the roots will only stay shallow. So um, you have to kind of space it out and uh, say start with seedlings twice a day and then go to once a day and then once every other day. But a full grown tomato plant should only get watered about once a week. Usually if they're struggling, it's most, most likely nutrients. Um, if plant's not growing and you're providing ample water, um, the plants will tell you. So certain types like brassicas, um, the leaves, they don't like the sun, they don't like the um, heat. So their leaves will get really wilty. So we try to water them first thing in the morning just to give them a boost throughout the day. And it also depends on your soil type because some types of soil lets the water drain too quickly. So if you have like a sandy soil, mm -hmm. um, it helps to amend it with compost or something else that will help the soil retain water. Mm -hmm. So that way you don't have to water as often. Got it. And, and for soil, is it important that you test your soil? And I always see those testing kits. Yeah. Um, especially if you've been growing for a little while because as you grow plants will deplete nutrients from the soil um, there's soil tests out there that are relatively inexpensive take a little bit of your soil as sometimes as few as like two or three tablespoons um, and send it off it takes about a week and it'll give you a good idea of what the baseline is there's some services that will cost a little bit more like 50 to 60 bucks mm -hmm. to and they'll tell you what you should do to your soil to to fix it. Generally, if you haven't planted anything before, it's always good just to throw an inch or two on, of compost on top of the soil that you're going to be planting in and just um, break up the soil a little bit and mix that up into the soil. Compost is, is nature's black gold. It's how it regenerates itself from the forest and everything by stuff breaking down. So always good to just start with compost and go from there. And if you have a bad gopher problem, is it important that you try to fix it with, with wires and stuff first, or can you just switch to pots? If you have gophers, they're going to come back at some point in this yeah. we're, we're trying to do control. And there's a ton of different things you can do. There's um, nifty gadgets that will emit a pulse that like you stick into the ground and it'll emit a pulse and it supposedly keeps the gophers away. We haven't tried those personally. Um, we do trapping. Um, so we have at least um, two different types of traps, but at least five or six traps in the ground most days. So definitely do pots. There's also gopher cages. So if you're doing like tomatoes, um, peppers and stuff like that, where if the gopher eats the stem of that, the whole plant's dead, mm -hmm. uh, you can plant the root base into one of those wire baskets. So they'll never, they might nibble on the outskirts of the roots, but they'll never get down to the stalk. So right now you're going to be doing starters for people to be able to get going. What would you suggest people start planting right now in the next few weeks? Springtime is the right time to plant everything, really. Uh, maybe hold off on peppers for a little bit longer. Uh, peppers and eggplant. Uh, Lompoc Valley is, um, there's a reason why there's so much agriculture here because everything loves to grow. As the temperatures get warmer in June, um, hold back on planting broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage and lettuces because they don't like the heat of the summertime as much you can plant those but you need to provide like a shade cloth or you need to keep them misted because if they get too warm um they'll bolt to seed pretty quickly so if somebody does want to do an organic garden and what what types of tools would be good to have on hand or things to consider especially if they're going to grow things like tomatoes for example um what should they be thinking about using uh first of all google um, <laughs> um, if you're going to do like carrots and leafy greens, flea beetles around here are terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'll need something to keep those at bay. You can use like cayenne spray. So if you do a mixture of like cayenne pepper and garlic, it will keep a lot of the bugs at bay. It's like you had ladybugs that you were trying yeah, to Yeah, they're, they're hard to find right now. Uh, normally, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, I didn't realize this, but um, one of the results of all of the um, forest fires we had in the past year is their natural habitats and where they source the ladybugs from to get them going has been absolutely devastated. So there's like a national shortage of ladybugs. Uh -huh. um, so we, we were able to get our um, hands on some. Um, we paid about five times more than what we normally did, um, but we, we needed to do it this year because there was the aphid population was getting out of control. Yeah. Uh, but in other ones, um, know your bugs, praying mantises. If you see a praying mantis in your garden, let it be. Keep an eye on your plants. Like if you have aphids starting up um, on your 
brassicas or especially Brussels sprouts are the worst. You can go out there and like get a pair of gloves on and smush them with your fingers. They're hiding underneath the leaves on the bottom side of the leaves. If you can keep the population low to begin with, the plant will have a, a, the ability to, to still produce. And then worst case scenario, aphids, you know, they don't really taste like anything. So Aphids are the new hemp seeds. Hey, uh, aphids for breakfast, eh? <laughs> In my smoothie. I think it's like a little extra protein. Yeah, probably, yeah. In, in quantity. I have had some. It's like, I think they just get stuck in my molars and then it's hard to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I make you brush your teeth before we kiss. Oh, shut up. Because I don't want aphids. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, sorry. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I think I. Wait, he, you're welcome. Not oh, that, Jeremy. Sorry, you, I always. You answered a lot of my questions, and I really appreciate it. So hopefully, I have better luck. I did order some gopher cages. Yes, we're gonna do. Um, we're gonna go at full least on tomatoes. Some tomato plants. Tomatoes. We got south face inside of the house. Lots of sun. Yep. Hopefully, it's warm enough. And but that's what killed our tomatoes last year. Was a gopher just came and it was doing so good. And Hungry then little the Next day, it just was dead. I never got to meet him. <laughs> But he probably grew like twice his size just from eating our tomato plants. Thanks. Uh, Ogre. So, yeah, hopefully you'll get outside this weekend. Yes. And, um, well, it's not the weekend yet. Oh, yeah. We've still got to get through Friday. Right. Friday show, 830 in the morning. And then uh, we should talk about fr this Friday night. We're we're going big on this one. So we have our happy hour. We have a It's OK. It's yes. a, we have a happy hour and we're bringing okay. in James Sparks from King's Carry Wines. Are you asking me? Or are you? No, I'm, just, I'm just, I'm telling you in case you didn't know. Yeah. Want to James make sure. Sparks is also the winemaker at Liquid Farm. And Amazing. then he, him and his wife, Anna, have their own brand called King's Carry. Yes. Where they do some Semillon, which is absolutely my new favorite white. It tastes like gooseberries and, but it's also like just got this kind yeah. of vibrant orange peel. Um, I think it, you're getting distracted. I love Semillon. Um, and then he so, has a rosé and a grenache. Yes. And they're going to be doing... Oh, hang on. So it, just tasting with James and the wines, that would be great enough. We're going to have a lot of fun. But we decided to kick it up an extra notch and bring in the folks at Tom's Burgers. So Tom's Burgers and James, they've worked a couple times before to do some winemaker, uh, fun winemaker dinners. So we're going to get the burger crew together at Tom's and we're going to get James here live. And we're just going to have a party on yep. Friday night at 530. Yeah. There are deals too. So if you go to our Facebook page, Good Morning Lompoc, just scroll, you'll find the post about the happy hour. Tom's is offering some special burgers to pair. And if you order some wine or order some food, you can pick up both your food and your wine at Tom's yep. on Friday. Yep. So all the information you, you need to know is on that post. If you have any questions, or you're like, I think I heard something cool. Uh, just message us and we'll be happy to catch you up. Yes, all those absolutely. We're very excited we for may, that. Maybe we'll stuff. play like the newlywed game with the Tom's crew and James. See yeah. how much they know about each other. I'm going to be stuffing my face with fries, hopefully. Yep. Hopefully they're making We'll fries. turn down the volume for that part. <laughs> yeah, just turn my mic off for that. Yeah. You guys are so awesome. Thank you. We got a couple messages yesterday. S super sweet messages yes, from people outside the day. area that were turned on to the show by some of our best friends so thank you for sharing and for yes. getting the word out and um we've made some people smile and that makes us feel really uh, good. Makes so, sense. That's so good hope you guys have a great earth day don't forget to hug your family take care of the planet and we'll see you friday morning and check out the virtual event it should be fun it's yes. going all day and um maybe learn a little bit too about the our history here and how many cool things we have yeah. happening so um and then our moment of zen you got this last night at yeah, so surf beach. i went out to surf beach it was a little bit windy but because it was Earth Day, I wanted to get some fresh material. So this is just if you go to Surf Park, uh, Surf Beach Park. Ocean Park. Ocean Park. Yep. I think. Yeah. Ocean Park. Uh, they're open till sunset. Uh, anyway, just some gorgeous views if the sun's out and uh, you can capture uh, the last little piece of light. Yes. It's really beautiful. So have a great day. Have a great day. Happy Earth guys. Day. Here is your moment of Zen. Thank you, Jacob Cole.